Hello and welcome to another episode of Weather or Not. I'm your host, David Guerrero, joined by our forecaster, Ben Yaya. Now, Ben, this weekend is the most anticipated football game of the year. It is the Penn State-Michigan game. How will the weather fare for this weekend during the game and for early next week? Yeah, David, it's going to be mostly sunny on Saturday, a little bit on the chilly side, but mostly sunny, and I do see a warm-up coming at the end of the weekend and into the beginning of next week. Oh, that sounds great. And you know, Ben, it seems like we're in a bit of a temperature roller coaster so far this week. Some days we're below average, some days we're over average. So I'm looking forward to seeing you talk about that in more in detail in your short range forecast and in your extended forecast. But before the short range, we'll have nature in the news. Then later in the show, Dennis Kruloff will be going back in time to recap the Denora Smog event. But first, here is nature in the news. A tale of fire and ice has recently been discovered in the vast tundra of Alaska. In the watersheds of the Yukon and Kuskokwim River deltas, scientists have uncovered a surprising link between wildfires and the release of methane from the ground in western Alaska. NASA's Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment, or ABOVE, has uncovered a correlation between wildfire history and methane emission into the atmosphere. In fact, these methane quote-unquote hotspots are 29% more likely to occur in areas burned from a wildfire in the past 50 years compared to areas that have not yet seen fire. The reason for this correlation is due to the part that the tundra is a good sink for atmospheric carbon, meaning that it's an effective absorber of carbon dioxide. The permafrost, which remains frozen year-round, acts as a bank storing carbon for centuries. Near water-rich areas, such as river deltas, Microbes feed on this carbon and excrete that methane gas as a byproduct. When a fire comes through, the permafrost actually melts and leads to the release of methane back into the atmosphere. Methane is an extremely effective and powerful greenhouse gas and is 80 times more effective at warming the planet than carbon dioxide is. With portions of the Alaskan tundra experiencing drought and higher temperatures, fire in an otherwise icy environment may become more common in the coming years. Last week, record-breaking rain from Storm Kieran caused severe flooding in Italy's Tuscany region, trapping residents in their homes and overturning cars. The heavy rainfall caused the Vicenzo River in Tuscany to burst its banks, further worsening the flooding. The storms have claimed the lives of at least six people in Italy and one in Albania, bringing the total death toll across Europe to 14 this week. Albania experienced flooded roads while huge waves and strong winds impacted the Balkans' Adriatic shores. The storm left thousands without electricity, disrupted transportation, and caused widespread damage in several European countries. It's been a pleasant week so far, but will our luck be running out for the Penn State-Michigan football game? For Friday, this looks threatening, I know, but the rain across Pennsylvania will be mostly on the light side and, shower, and with showery activity. It will be mostly light. This low pressure system is just a little bit too far to the north to really cause any major problems, especially in the form of snow here in the northern tier of the country, the New England. This cold front will be bringing the threat for some pretty strong winds for our Friday. State College will be on the breezy side, but if you're going to the Lake Erie shoreline, winds could be gusting up to 30 miles per hour, so you should absolutely hold on to your hats if you're going to the shoreline. For the big game day on Saturday, it'll be actually clearing out mostly sunny skies for a majority of the state. Can't rule out a brief spotty shower for the Erie shoreline, although our rain will be far to the south into the Virginias and some lake effect snow up into the northern tier of New York. Speaking of the big football game, our kickoff is at noon, so I will be keeping the high temperature at around kickoff at 46 degrees. But look at the tailgates, only 35 degrees for around 8 a.m. when you're heading out to Beaver Stadium. Though by the fourth quarter, 41 degrees, it'll be mostly sunny throughout the entire game. Weather will not be a big player for 
the, for the game. Sunday, high pressure will begin to dominate as it migrates over into New York. Mostly sunny skies for almost everyone. Can't rule out a couple clouds for the Erie shoreline. And mostly cool conditions. It'll actually be about five degrees below average for this time of year. So for this weekend, Friday will be our warmest day. Can't rule out the chance for a brief spotty shower, especially in the early morning. High temperature will be around 50 degrees. Friday night, we'll, we will begin to clear those clouds away and lower the chance for some rain. Seasonably cool at a temperature of 33 degrees. Saturday is the big football game. 48 degrees will be our high, likely happening around the first and second quarter, and sunshine will be making a return. Saturday night, it will be a winter-like chill with lows into the upper 20s for State College. And Sunday, our high will be 46 degrees, though Sunday will be living up to its name under superbly sunny skies. Our fall foliage map shows that everything's basically dead. Only into the far southern reaches of the state will you begin to see some colors. So if you're taking a nature walk in State College and enjoying the sunshine, probably not going to be seeing a whole lot of color out there. Dennis Krulov is up next with the Denora Smog Event feature. 75 years ago, one of the worst air pollution disasters in the United States happened here in our local state. Zooming into the small town of Denora, Pennsylvania, that is nestled about an hour south of Pittsburgh, the worst air pollution disaster struck during the last week of October in 1948. Within the town, two major industrial plants, one zinc plant and a steel mill, spewed out streams of toxic pollutants into the air on a daily basis. During the late 1940s, seeing these chemicals spew into the air was a sign of progress and prosperity, as it meant work was getting done to boost the local town's economy. Clear smokestacks and clear skies meant potential incoming economic depression and a loss of jobs. However, on the morning of October 27, 1948, the pollution that developed in the town was not as cheerful as one would hope. The concentrations were significantly denser than normal and stuck around, which made it so dangerous for the residents. The more technical term for this significant pollution is smog, and is defined as when there is a high amount of consecration surface pollution that is enough to reduce the surface visibility. The weather played a significant role in these higher concentrations. Prior to the smog event, a cold front moved through the region in which a high pressure system developed in its wake, which led to stagnated air. This stagnated air led to an inversion to develop in the lower part of the troposphere. An inversion develops when the most dense and coldest air is stuck around the bottom of the surface, in which this case was the valley where the Nora sits, while warmer and less dense air is several thousand feet above the surface. With pollution actively exported from the factories, and with this inversion in place, the smoke and polluted air particles were not able to rise above the inversion boundary, leading to very poor air quality in the valley. So as the smog moved in on October 27th, it continued into the following days. And due to the very poor regulations and policies in place, the public was not educated on the air's toxicity. On October 29th, Denora hosted its annual Halloween parade, where lots of people and children were out in the streets for extended periods of time. The following day, the high school team played their football game in extremely low visibility. However, it wasn't long after until the health effects began to take a toll on the citizens. Later that night, as emergency calls began to come in, Due to the extremely reduced visibility in darkness of night, some emergency vehicles had to be guided by personnel walking in front of these vehicles with flashlights. However, this method became nearly impossible as emergency personnel began to walk door to door across the town to warn those with chronic health conditions to evacuate. However, due to the extreme poor visibility, 
road conditions began nearly impossible to traverse. At 2 a.m. on October 30th, three days after the smog settled in, the first death was reported. Throughout the day, an additional 17 deaths came in. The significant smog came to an end when a front brought in rains to the town on October 31st. Throughout the entire smog event, which lasted almost five full days, 20 individuals were confirmed to pass away and 5,900 faced health consequences, which was roughly 43% of the population of the Nora in 1948. However, the end of the smog event did not mean the health consequences came to an end. Years and decades to follow, studies showed that deaths due to cardiovascular disease was significantly higher in the Nora than neighboring towns, proving that smog can have long-term effects. Just four years later, a similar smog event impacted London, England, where a week-long event due to coal ovens killed over 4,000 people. However, it wasn't until 1955 when Congress passed the Air Pollution Act, and down the line in 1970, the United States passed the Federal Clean Air Act, in which the Donora smog event played a large factor. In memory of those past, the Pennsylvania Historic and Museum Commission commem- commemorated the Donora smog with their historical marker. And thanks to the regulations of past, the air in major cities and communities alike today have become much healthier to breathe in. For whether or not, I'm Dennis Krulov. Our weekend looks really nice, but what does the work week have in store? Our weekend recap shows that Friday will be our most overcast day with a high of 50 degrees. Can't rule out the chance for a shower, although it will be pretty windy out there. Our low will be about 33 degrees. Our Saturday, we will be dropping a little bit below normal with mostly sunny skies for the big game, the low of 29. And Sunday, we'll have abundant sunshine with a high of 46 and a low of 27. Our week ahead shows that a warming trend will begin, starting out below average for Monday and Tuesday, although by Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we will be going well above normal. In fact, possibly tickling 60 degrees on our Friday. And now, here is your Weather Whiz Quiz. Ben, I'm so excited about the pleasant conditions for Sunday's game. And talking about Sunday's game and keeping it with the topic of Penn State football, what was the snowiest game ever recorded in Penn State football history? Is it A, Notre Dame in 1987, or B, Michigan in 1995, C, Iowa in 2008, or D, Illinois in 2011? And if you guess B, you are correct. You know, Ben, it's rather fitting for the snowiest game to be against Michigan since that's our opponent for this weekend. And I'd say they are our biggest rival. So hopefully we get the win. Absolutely, David. I'm super excited for this game. Although snow will not be any uh, factor for this football game. You know, it's unfortunate. I love a good snow game, but I love pleasant conditions as well. And hopefully... We stormed the field, too, because that would yes. be an amazing opportunity. That, that would be very exciting, although not in my forecast to see a storm on the field. Well, that is all we have for you today. Join us next week for another episode of Weather or Not. Thank you.